Welcome to Archery Talk 101 podcast, your guide to better archery skills. We'll bring you the latest tips, tricks, and expert advice, but that's not all. We'll also have interviews with top archers and industry professionals and reviews of the latest gear and equipment and much more. So you're tired of shooting your bow with uh, all the gadgets on there? Well, you know what? We might have the answer for you. Here on uh, the special episode 100 of Archer Talk 101, I'm going to be your host today. My name is Roy Canterbury, and we have a special guest on the line with us that is going to tell us just why you want to go simple and get rid of all the hassles of all the wheels and the releases and you know all the stuff that go along with the compound bows. Uh, we have on the line with us here, uh, Tom. Uh, how about if you introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little something about yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Lindley. I am one of the co-founders of TT2 Archery. We are just a small group here in the Metro Detroit area that focuses strictly on traditional archery and preserving the tradition and heritage of traditional archery. Um, TT2 got started back in, I think, 2015, um, myself and one of my friends were sitting in a pop-up blind in the woods in northern Michigan with two compound bows and decided that we wanted to try to do something different. So um, that's how it got started. We started out with, I think, four bows between the two of us, and now we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 or something like that. But um, traditional archery to me is going back to the simplicity of archery. Um, it's a stick and a string. It's you versus whatever you're going to shoot. So um, it, I shot competition archery for a while and uh, back in the day, and I just fell out of love with it. So traditional archery was my way to get back into it. So if they were interested in contacting uh, TT2 Archery, how would they do that? So we do have a Facebook page. It's at TT2 Archery. Or um, we do also have an email. It's TT2 Archery at gmail.com. Okay. That way, that if they want to get a hold of you, and they can contact you and get some information. And so you're in uh, Detroit area then is where you're, yeah. you're located. Yes, sir. So anybody in that area, hey, this is a group to go check out. Uh, I'm sure you guys like to help new archers out or, or those to going to get into the traditional archery. And It's one of the coolest things about traditional archery is like a big family. You can go to a rendezvous anywhere in the Midwest, and it's like all of your brothers that you haven't seen in forever. You may have never even met the person, but they're always super, super willing to help. Um, help you get set up, help you make the right decisions um, when you're purchasing a bow, um, which is what it's all about. If you have the wrong equipment, you instantaneously hate the sport and never want to do it. So um, it's one of the fun parts of it is I've been fortunate enough to purchase a lot of bows over the years, and I share those with whoever wants to come and learn. So it's kind of our thing is, we just try to help promote the sport. We don't really sell anything or manufacture anything. It's just about promoting the sport. Yeah, that's uh, that's always good, you know, help the new archers out. And, you know, hence that's why I called the podcast Archer Talk 101, because it's it's all out about, you know, helping the archers out, whether you're just starting out um, or you're an advanced shooter. You know, there's always help. And there's always somebody out there that can help you. And, you know, like it's it's a worldwide sport, and you use the uh, a definition I use for archery. You know, stick and string. You know, my definition of an archery is a stick and a string flinging another stick. And you know, if it's archery, it fits in that category. I don't care if you're shooting a longbow recurve, um, you know, any of the other uh, different styles of uh, tradition type bows, compounds, crossbows. You know, they all fit in that category. Some might have wheels on it and some don't. You know, some have sights on them, some don't. And, you know, the traditional archery, you can use them with sights or without sights. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that, hey. It, I'm a true yeah. instinctive traditional archer, no sights. I shoot with fingers and a glove. Um, I don't 
aim. It's like throwing a baseball. You just pick your spot and let her rip. Yeah, and, and that's that's how I I learned to do it was, you know, just pick the spot and just shoot. You know, eventually you're going to learn how to do that and practice, and practice practice. <laughs> and practice some more. You know, and now there's all kinds of different things like, like they call it string walking, where you're moving your hands up and down the string. And I've I, tried and, with not a lot of success. Yeah, and then they say, okay, using the tip of the arrow as a reference, like. If I'm going to look at the tip, I'm going to put a sight on it. Right, very true. Yeah, that that's just me. I just, uh, you know, and when I get my uh, recurve in my hand, you know, I'm shooting instinctively. I don't look for sights. That's why I have my recurve set up for bow fishing. You know, so you don't have time to pick a sight. You know, when when you're bow fishing, it appears, you shoot, and it's gone. You know, it could be two seconds from C to to gone. So you don't have time to do anything. You have time to draw back, get back your point, and fall through. That's about all you have time for. I get a compound in my hand, and now I'm looking for sights, anchor point, heat, cancer, but you know all that stuff in there. And I can't shoot them fast. Like there, there's just no way because my mental attitude is different depending on which weapon I pick up. Right. I picked up my compound bow for the first time in about ten years, and never changed the setup it was literally in the case i grabbed a couple arrows i shot three arrows with fingers and three arrows of my release and put it back in the case and said well i've done that now. um it was just like grand book it, i put three arrows in the 10 ring out of six i was good yeah <laughs> i'm not no, that I... good with my draft books, so it's for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I know when i i first got my first compound i was shooting fingers because you know, I grew up in the, the 60s. There was no compound bows when I started. You know, there was only recurves, long bows. You had your choice of wood or fiberglass. You know, that was that was it. And you shot fingers, wood arrows. So I got my compound. I, I shot that for a while until I, I had to get another one. And it was a little bit shorter. And next thing you know, my ring finger's going numb. So I had to go to release. And then that's a whole new, you know, a whole new world that you, you got to get into. And um, you know, being nice and simple. I, I, I use the glove. I never really liked tab because it held my fingers together. I like the flexibility of the, the glove. Um, I'm a glove guy. I have I have tabs too, but I, my preference is actually a glove. Now, on my recurve, I have the, what they call the no gloves. You know, using bow fishing, I don't want the leather on my hand, so I just have those on there, and I don't I don't need anything on my fingers. I just it just rolls off my fingers and. You know, makes it a little bit easier. So, what what made you get started in archery? Um, I remember when I was probably twelve to thirteen years old, my dad and one of his friends and his son decided we were going to go on a hunting trip, and we went to Jackson, Michigan, over very close to Ted Nugent's place, um, and. My dad gave me this little bear white tail bow and some arrows with field points on them. I'd never hunted before ever, um, other than maybe a squirrel hunter rabbit hunter with a shotgun when I was, you know, maybe 10 or 11. And uh, I walked into the woods probably, or we went to an apple orchard actually. And I walked in about six rows of trees or so, and there were like 15 deer there and I was hooked. Of course, I got field points, a bow I've never shot before. It was terrible, but um, I didn't even actually shoot. But as soon as I saw those deer and I was that close, it was cool. I was good to go. Yeah, when you get that close to the animal and and it's just it's something a little different than, you know, with the gun where you, you know, a lot of, a lot of firearm shooters, they, you know, I've asked them, have you shot a deer under 100 yards? And most of them say no. Like, well, as an archer, we're not even getting excited yet. It's not even close to being in range. I tell people I don't even shoot at them unless I can see the snot frozen in their nose. <laughs> yeah. You know, with the recurve, you do have a little bit less range than you do with a compound. But, right. it, you know, it's just a matter of practice. And, you know, I haven't hunted with my recurve yet just because I don't want to, I don't want to spend, spend the time to get good enough to take the recurve out. Um, you know, I actually hunt um, by 
Kenny, the co-founder of TT2. Um, we actually hunt from the ground, usually in a ground blind. Um, a lot of times, we, no blind. We'll just go out. He's got a place in the central Michigan that we go to often. And we just kind of meander out there and find a spot and sit out. Oh, that, that's the nice thing about archery is you can go pretty much anywhere and you know you can get on a lot of properties that you can't get with a firearm you know because yeah. they're it's it's a lot safer and you know you're not going to accidentally shoot something you don't want and you know when you have that rifle in your hand you've got to be aware of what's on the other side because they don't stop or arrow you don't have quite the range very true you know if you're shooting a deer and you're on the ground you know it's not going to go that far past it before it actually hits the ground, especially after it goes through the deer. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> so, so what's been your most memorable hunt you've been on? Um, we first started TT2 probably around 20, when we started in 2015, we decided in this one particular piece of property that we wanted to figure out how to make the deer come to us. And we spent a lot of that fall in the next spring and summer working towards that. And one evening, Kenny and I were both sitting in a ground blind 40 yards behind the cabin. And we had five deer and 30 turkeys that we could reach out at all. So um, that was, and we never shot. But just getting them in that close and actually succeeding in what we were trying to do was pretty. Yeah, to get them in that close, that was definitely a, a challenge. The turkey were actually brushing their wings across the side of the line. When they would walk by, oh. their heads would pop up. You could reach out and grab them. Oh, that is close. One of the coolest things we've done at TT2, we have a little boy in our, in our city that had cancer. And we got the archery community to actually donate a boat in. And he, he made it. So that's a good thing. Yeah, he was, was, uh, was he able to get out and, and get himself a deer or a turkey or something? Or? He's, he's 12 years old, and I gave him his first lesson last summer. Cool. Yeah, it's always nice when you can you have the equipment that you can help somebody out like that. Yeah, we reached out to a bunch of different people, and Al Kimry from the Northwest, um, Trad Al Bowes, actually made him a custom built bow, sent it to Michigan. Well, I, that's that's good. There's you know you get a lot of that in the community, don't you? There's a lot Absolutely. of people reaching out and and helping out in any way they can, and it, the folks from New Woods Bowes helped out. Um, we had a lady in Pennsylvania that she used to make sleeves and all that kind of stuff. His favorite superhero is Spider-Man, so she made him a Spider-Man case for his bow. Um, I fleshed him up some Superman and Aquaman arrows. Um, it was really cool. Sounds like it's a lot of fun, you know, doing doing that kind of stuff. It's something a little different than you know making regular arrows. Yeah, it was it was pretty neat. We went and picked up all the materials and know kind of thought through the process knew who his favorite superheroes were so we tried to make it something because he is none of his family hunt so none of them are in archery so we wanted to see if he liked it so we were able to get him over here first shot was in a in a uh, dice morel target and um, he put it right in the tent on his first arrow so it was super exciting oh, oh yeah that, that gets them hooked doesn't it oh well, yeah they were they probably it was hot that day and they were here for a couple of hours, so it was it was really fun. A hot day and shooting that well, yeah, it's like it gets you hooked, doesn't it? Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, so that, it's probably my that's my highest point so far. Yeah, that that definitely sounds like something that would be you know inspiration, and and the reason why you do this is is when you get something like that you can see how well they they enjoy it and and you know as as an instructor you know I've been an arch instructor since 95 
And, you know, when you get somebody out there that has never shot before and they're leery of shooting and they take that first shot and it's like, oh, this is fun. Can I do it again? Well, yeah. The answer is always, always it's yes. You want to do it some more? Let's do it some more. Let's do it some more. You know, it's, it's that first shot that just, it's just so exciting that they're afraid of it. And then, you know, some are afraid of it. Some are just, you know, leery because they've never done it before. And then that first shot goes off and it's like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> They're cool. I had a my one of my dad's friends owned an archery shop here in Taylor. And I would go there and help. Um, I worked midnight to my real job. So I would go help out during the day there. And it ended up that I was there five days a week. Um, it just, I couldn't stop. It was just what I wanted to do. So. I would go there in the mornings and help out, get everything ready for the day, go home, take a nap. And he had, during the winter, he would actually have five nights worth of league. So Monday night was traditional archery night. Tuesday night was women's night. Um, it was kind of like helped out with the range on Tuesday nights. Wednesday and Thursday were men's unlimited. So I shot both of those. And then uh, Friday was the kids' leagues. And I helped out with all the little kids. It was It was really fun. Yeah, it sounds like it, and it's something to do in the wintertime to keep the sport going, and, and you know, archery stores in the wintertime yeah, don't don't seem to do real well sometimes because everybody's out hunting. You know, you, you aren't buying new equipment, you know, that's, you know, you have to worry about, you know, the 3D shooting season, you know, that's when you can start getting up in the summer and just before hunting season, you know, everybody comes in once arrows, you know, the, you know, right. two weeks before hunting season or needs are both worked on and open it up and it's like my strings broke bring it in and say is it normal the string to broke break you open up the case there's broadheads sitting in the case uh yep <laughs> you have yep. broadheads in the case <laughs> every time they're gonna break you had a, a broadhead exposed in your case and i keep broadheads in my case all the time but it's inside the quiver so they're not going to cut anything exactly. and I'll never forget we had a guy that showed up and he came into the shop and he had taken his bow to work and put it in the trunk in a case. And he, you have to see this. We go out there and the quarter panel has this giant bash coming outwards. And one of the bus cables let loose and the limb just let her rip, went right through the case, smashed the quarter panel of the car, the bow's in, still in the case, stuffed out the end of it. It was just like, well, I guess we can sell you a new book because I don't think there's much fixing that one. <laughs> yeah, you're going to need new limbs and new cams for sure and new strings and cables. Uh, yeah, but the only thing good left is the riser. Because <laughs> right. you replace one limb, you had to replace them both. So <laughs> do you make your own strings then for your bows or do you have someone else get them? I do make all my own strings. Um, I make some for friends as well. Um, Still not an expert at it. They're getting better, but I do try to make all my own strings. Um, currently, I use um, B55, you know, your standard traditional material. And then I use Halo Serving. Um, just seems to be a lot more durable. We shoot an awful lot. So the Halo Serving is, it lasts a really good long time. Yeah, that Halo Serving is good. I, I've been making strings for, well, since 2001 <laughs> when I when I got my story learned how to make strings and you know I've, I've made them ever since and um, you know for the rig curves the normal string I use 8125 for compounds but I got the the b50 that I use for you know the recurve stuff and that b55 is also another another good string for recurves and uh, I use a little bit of the halo because it's nice it has different colors and it's a nice thick serving and seems to hold up really well it does hold up like to not wear because i for whatever reason i know it seemed to be kind of tight um it did actually last for a really long time i don't think i've reserved a string that i've made yet using it yeah the norvis serving material is pretty good but that that halo is just a little it's different completely different material it's it's kind of unique in the way it they've made it. Use the cotton cloth white and black braided stuff i don't even remember what it was called back in the day but I'd like the halo a lot better 
like like a, a diamond braid or something. There's the white and black, and there's also a couple other colors as well um, yep. that you can get for them. Uh, you know, I use that a lot of for the compounds just because you know it needs to be a little thinner. You know, don't need to be quite you know stand up to the hitting the arm guard and and stuff like that. That your recurves need to stand up for that. You know, on a compound, you only need enough serving to put the knock on. You don't need any more than that because you're not exactly. going to be hitting your arm or anything else anyway. So you don't need all that information, you know, all that extra stuff. You know, you know, like on the recurves, we normally find the center point go three inches up and six inches down, and you know, because you got to accommodate for the glove and the arm guard and everything else. Because right. you do have tendency to hit your arm guard a little bit more. Um, I hold mine like I do my compounds, so I don't hit my arm like you know you normally would. You know, because I hold a little bit different angles like I do my compounds. Uh, so I don't use my arm as if I tired if i've overexerted myself or shot too much although yeah. d style longbows i still struggle with those i beat my arm up pretty good usually when I shoot <laughs> yeah so style bow, i have a hard time shooting but they're really fun and they're awesome bows but i have a hard time shooting them, so <laughs> yeah what what would you recommend for somebody just starting out? You know, how would you go about sizing a bow for them? So what I tell everyone, I have lots of people that want to come try. And I guess the the best advice I can give you is find somebody like myself or, you know, that has a, a decent selection of bows where you can go try everything. Um, the other part of that is, is that you shoot with your body, not your ego. So don't over ego your draw weight. Um, you can kill a deer with a 40 pound bow just as easily as you can kill a deer with a 62 and a half pound. Um, it's one thing that will make you hate the sport more than anything is if you over bow yourself and it's a struggle every time you shoot. Um, it just doesn't make it enjoyable and you're not gonna do it as often. Um, try to tell everybody to start out with a bow that is a little bit less than what you think you're going to need and then work yourself up into that custom made you know multiple thousand dollar bow after you're you know you've, you've gotten into it and know what you like and you know what your ideal poundage is and then go out there and have someone go do that custom yeah, I've seen people pull them back their recurve and they can't even get their fingers back to their mouth. It's like like your your thumb. They come back and their fingers are still three or four inches in front of their, their mouth. And it's like, uh, get a little bit lighter bow because you can't pull that one. You need to come back to a good anchor point. It's not a consistent anchor point. And you know, I've seen people do that. And of course, some of them shoot really well, but you know, it's you know, just start off with something, something light, you know. You can always go up later. In my training wheel bow, um, I shot it at 77 pounds. Um, I would never try to shoot a week or 77 pounds. Um, <laughs> you know, my ideal weight for a recurve is somewhere between, I mean, I have bows from 15 pounds all the way up to 55 pounds. Um, but uh, my ideal weight is somewhere in that 40 to 50 range. I have a really long draw length. Um, I just put together a new Air AMAG bow this past weekend that I just purchased. Um, and I had a set of 52 pound limbs on an A riser. And I have a 29 and three quarter inch draw length. I shoot that bow at 62 and a half pounds. And uh, that's plenty enough for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No let off on them. No, it's. It's fast, and that thing slings a 640 green arrow like there is no tomorrow. But um, you get tired really quick. But I'm hoping that I can build myself up. That that's the bow I think I'm going to accomplish. Although, as you yeah. can see, I have a variety of selection. <laughs> yeah, and for those listening, yeah, you look behind him, and he's got what about 15, 20 bows hanging up behind him. I think there's 17 back there right now. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it makes a really nice looking backstop. All the bows yeah, and arrows figured. hanging up. <laughs> I figured it'd make a nice backstop. Yeah, 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 it's it's pretty cool to see all those different bows and 
Looks like a lot of them are a bear. Yeah, I'm a kind of a collector, not as active as a lot of people, but I do have several bear bows. I think the oldest one I have is a 1953 or 1954 bowler. And then I have a 50th anniversary take down bow. And then the same bag that I just got is actually a model year 23. So I have everything in between. Um, and for Michigan, it's got to be a bear. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta be a bear. I, I know some of the bow manufacturers will actually custom custom make them. And I know when I had my store, I was I was a Martin dealer as well. And you know, for the recurves, and they had the guy come in and as he wanted this bow. So I we we ordered it and says, Well, we need it to fit somebody with a medium-sized hand. And so they custom made the grip to to fit him and it got it up and it's like perfect fit. You know, that it, it's you know, some of the manufacturers will do that and, and some won't, but you know, it Those just so happened. Compound bows with a Martin Warthog. I actually still have it. Yeah, some of the some of the compounds are really not much you can do. You know, the grip's not like what you like. There's you can take it off and that's that's about it. And you now for me, I prefer the skinnier ones because in my hand more relaxed. You know, always it's forced it open and then you know when I you know, normally point my index finger basically to my target and it's real fat, then I end up pointing it off at an angle. And so I never really liked the big fat grips. I always like the Skinner grips because it relaxed my hand more. Yeah, I think uh, you get a lot of, I think depending on your hand size, um, I think you can get a lot of bow torque with a larger grip bow um, just by the way you hold your hand and you don't even really realize. I have two customs um, that I have one of them I bought myself for my 50th birthday um, from Canada to Customs, and that bow fits me perfectly. And the funny part is, is that he already had the bow built, and I met him at a show, and the rest is history. I wrote the check and brought it home. But, uh, and then I have one that I actually picked out the wood for, and that's one of the cool things is, is that traditional bows are like artwork. Um, yeah. It, if you get the right boyer and you can ask them to do just about anything for you and with the new technology with them uh, stabilizing wood and using pearls and all different kinds of things and epoxy stabilize the, the actual lumber they'll last forever and they can do some really really cool stuff yeah just you know whatever combination you want you know because you know, a lot of them are laminated anyway, so it really doesn't matter what kind of woods in them as long as, you know, they're at least somewhat compatible and you, know, you don't want something that is really soft and something really hard because that may not work very well, but, um, you know, they're, they're just, it's just <clears throat> something about the wood bows that, you know, they have their own little character in there. You know, where compound, you have this brand of compound, they all look the same. The camel pattern, the camel pattern all looks the same. Uh, and you know, with wood, no two bows look the same because that each piece of wood is unique in itself, and that's what's so so nice about you know having there those. Some, there are some guys out there that are artisans in making bows, and and uh, the things that they can do. There's a, a a man from Australia that makes bows, and he does like intricate inlays of just did one with some turtles and some iguanas and stuff that it's actually every piece is a different piece of wood inlaid in the riser. They're just phenomenal. Um, I hit him up on his Facebook page and asked him, um, you know, how long did it take you to make that? This one particular bow that he just finished a couple of months ago, it 800 man hours. <laughs> yeah, and, and if you're getting something like that, you know, you're, you're not worried about the cost because it's unique. There is no two alike, you know, because probably not going to. That was the first, was yeah, first cool, but yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. That was, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. So do you normally use wood arrows? Do you use carbon or a little both, or what are you using? I shoot aluminum, wood, and carbon. Um, it really depends on the bow and what I'm doing with it. Um, here lately, I've kind of gotten into a kick of building my own carbons I've, or building my own wood arrows. Um, I recently purchased all of the stuff to do my own spine testing. Um, 
do all my own tapering, all that kind of stuff. So um, I've been off on a tangent of building wood arrows here lately. I think over the winter I felt like eight or ten thousand. So um, I really like it and enjoy it. Um, it kind of helps me relax and unwind after a stressful day at my real job. So I can just set it up and, and uh, do that. It's pretty fun, actually. Kind of that other part of that whole creative thing, you can make them any way you want, make them look how you want. If yeah, you don't that's... like it, you can sand it off and start over. Yeah, yeah that, that's the nice thing about the wood arrows. You, you know, you, you have so many options, you know, putting different patterns in them and, you know, laminating pieces together. And, you know, of course, you have to worry about your spining when you're gluing all these other pieces in there. But, uh, you know, they, they've got some good, strong glues that are going to hold up just fine. Like, you know, a lot of times on a wood, the glue, glue joint is stronger than the wood. Yeah, I haven't tried to do any footed arrows yet. That's the next on my plan probably for this one is to try that. But it, I enjoy it. Um, right now, I'm I'm messing around with this new AMAG riser bow, so I'm kind of going between some traditional, um, traditional looking carbon arrows and um, some aluminum arrows, and then I'll probably build a set of woodies for that bow at some point before hunting season gets here and get them all dialed in too. But um, right now, just getting to know the bow and shoot it, I didn't want to take the time to build a new set of arrows, so I found some that spined out pretty good, and they actually shoot pretty straight. So I've been using those just to get the bow dialed in, and then I'll probably build a set for that particular that's what nice about archery is there's you can personalize it all you want and i know with with the the carbon arrows i i still shoot feathers i shoot four inch feathers i've shot four inch feathers for decades i don't plan on changing um you know i started with feathers and wood arrows in the 60s and i'm still shooting feathers <laughs> you know i'm not going to change i just like feathers you know there's a lot of advantages disadvantages but uh uh, for me, there's, you know, I've had the whole podcast, you know, talking about advantage of fletching with feathers and veins and, and all that. And, you know, mostly it's just a personal preference. What do you like? And, and now, you know, for, for you traditional archers, they've got some veins that are actually designed to be shot with the uh, recurves because they're a little softer. So they'll bend out of the way, you know, where the heart, you know, normal veins don't really bend out of the way and you get some really weird flight that way. and. Yeah, one of the one of the other guys from TT2, Carl, he actually bought some and we tried them out, messed around with them for a while. Um, pretty interesting to shoot them after shooting feathers for so long. How how they turn out? Were they as advertised or a little bit of okay. hype? We ended up refletching them with feathers. <laughs> Went back to feathers. <laughs> Went back to feathers. I mean, the technology, the arrow technology these days. Um, we shoot a lot of the gold tip traditional arrows, the gold tip brand um, traditional only arrows. And <laughs> amazingly enough, those things are <laughs> super forgiving. I, I have one right here. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's carbon arrow, but it looks like wood. Can't really yep. tell too well in, in, with, with the camera, with the background in there, but it's a wood gain. It's, it, that's what my son shoots out of his. They're, those arrows are super forgiving. I mean, you can hit something pretty hard with them. They'll stay straight and not break. Um, where if back in the 90s, when you owned your shop and when I was at Arrowhead, you hit something hard with the with a Eastern Carbon Arrow or one of the other manufacturers. Um, we had three-quarter inch, doubled up three-quarter inch plywood backstops behind all of the targets. And then we had um, Celsius bales for the indoor range. And uh, if you got one that went awry and ended up in that plywood, that arrow was usually toast. Where today, my son was out shooting with me the other day, first time he's shot probably two or three years, and he stuck one in a four by four and it came right out. Yeah, I know the, the first carbons, they were laid out differently. They were laid out, the fibers were linear from the, the, the tip to the, the knot for a straight line. So when they broke, they just exploded in a whole bunch of little carbon fibers. And when those come out, it's like, no, nah, I, I refuse to, to shoot carbons. 
until they started coming out, you know, little better carbons. And uh, you know, I had my store in 2001. Uh, of course, I was, a, I was a PSC dealer, and of course, I used the PSC arrows. Uh, I still have PSC arrows that I shoot, and, and they were a tough shaft. Um, I was shooting, getting ready for hunting season. I had my broadhead target out at the range because uh, it won't shoot in a regular backstop because it just tears them up. And I was tired. I shouldn't have been doing it, but I did it anyway, and I missed, and I took my muzzy broadhead and stuck it into a concrete block. Now the muzzy broadhead stuck into the block. And I go up there and the broadhead and half the insert is stuck to the, the block. And the other half the insert and the shaft are laying on the ground. The shaft was broke back about an inch. The broadhead didn't get hurt. I pulled the broadhead out. I still have it. I still use it. I don't even know which one it was nowadays because I couldn't tell the difference. Uh, and the shaft was was good. Cut a couple inches off the shaft and kids here. <laughs> you know, I couldn't use it anymore, but it's too short for me. But, you know, my, my son was you know, five or six at the time in Cub Scouts and he, all the arrows, we cut them all down and he'd shoot them for hours. And, you know, that's how tough the carbon is nowadays. And I've sent carbon arrows through steel, the commercial steel doors, you know, up up to the fletching. Wow. You know, just stuck, them, stuck them through. and uh you know with the field tip of course uh the broadheads probably wouldn't have made it quite so far because it's trying to cut a little bit too big of a hole but i was right. able to send carbon arrows that didn't hurt there at all you know it's just finished pulling it through it's one thing you can your setup you can use anything though know? that's the that's the good part it's personal preference it's it's what you like um you know, Traditional archery it, to me is a is a heritage, so I'll probably hunt with wood arrows this year. Um, maybe not if I use that AMAC because it's a metal riser bow, so I might stay a little bit more modern with that. But um, my Canadota Custom or or my New Woods bow, I'll probably shoot um, wooden arrows out of those. They're wooden bows. Um, it's just kind of that old nostalgia thing of doing it the old way, the hard way. Yeah, go go back to, to the primitive method, and you know what? It it worked sixty four thousand years ago, and it works still today. So, exactly. you know, what can you say they did sixty four thousand years ago that they're still doing today? Not a lot. <laughs> yeah, and not much. <laughs> yeah, a history of archery, and in the process of looking up. Um, for one of the podcasts, I, I just did a whole whole third series on just the history of it, talking about archery, and you know, I was able to find uh, where they had found evidence of uh, archery equipment that are sixty four thousand years old, what it dated back to. Wow. So that was that was kind of interesting that it was you know that old. And the other thing I also discovered is uh, uh, in fairly modern times, uh, I think. Back in the 60s, they actually, the military had a platoon that shot recurves. And they did a demonstration and they set a box up filled with dirt with three sections, you know, card, you know, uh, I think it's like a, a normal foot wide box or something. They put it into three sections and they shot it with a 45. They shot it with an, uh, Carbine M1 carbine, uh, and or an M1 grand and on a carbine. So you got your 45 calories, you got your 30 caliber, and you got your 30 at six. And then they shot it out of a recurve with a broadhead. Now, guess which the only one that went through the whole box? Had to have been the bubble. Yep, the broadhead penetrated through the complete broadhead, and part of the shaft was sticking out the other side of the box. And the aunt six only made it to the second section. Wow. The the 30 carbine made it into the second one, and the 45 didn't even pass through the first section. It's pretty unbelievable. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> a good piece of trivia to have, actually. Yeah, it's like okay, a broadhead, a 12 foot of dirt did not stop a broadhead. 
pretty impressive that I mean, if you think of all of the game animals that people hunt that are taken with a simple stick and a sharpened piece of metal, it's amazing. You know, I've seen archery hunts on television, obviously, um, taking an elephant with a bow. And it's just amazing to me that someone could actually do that. Well, and then to some states allow you to hunt with spears. Yes. I watch, yeah. there's a, there's a, forget the guy's name, but he does it pretty regularly, he has his own channel and stuff like that. And it's, it's pretty cool to watch him. You know, he was somewhere in Africa, I think, and actually took a coup out of a tree with a spear. It was pretty interesting to watch. Yeah, that, that takes a little bit. It's a completely different skill. Yeah. I think my next time I'll try an Adelaide and see how I, how good I am with it. Um, I actually have a friend that built one, so I just haven't actually made the dart and actually tried it yet. But um, that's on my list of things to do this summer is actually go someplace that has enough yardage that we can actually try it out and see how it works. That, that would be that would be kind of interesting. They had uh, um, this this last summer, I helped out in Nebraska has their outdoor expo. And I went up there and helped out in the archery stuff. And there was a guy that had had a setup there. I, I was busy you know, helping out with everybody else shooting the archery that I didn't get a chance to go up there and do that. I think this next year when I go up there and volunteer for it again, I'm going to go try one of those just to see. And they had axe throwing and, you know, just kind of different stuff. You know, I've never gone out and thrown an axe and try and hit a target with it. And I normally try to keep the axe in my hand, not let it leave. Exactly. <laughs> a couple of years ago, we were at Compton at the Compton Traditional Bowhunters Rendezvous over on the west side of the state. And um, one of the vendors, I might have been Three Rivers, I think, or one of them actually had an atlatl there that you could take and go try it out. That was actually pretty fun. Um, the line was so long to do it that I was like, ah, but I probably should. Yeah, sometimes you get a real long line. It's it's like, uh, I'll try it later. And then the line never goes down until they close. And... You were talking earlier about things that you recommend for other folks to do. And if you're thinking about getting into archery, um, find one of those rendezvous that's local somewhere in your area and actually go um, take a friend with you, go by yourself, however you decide you want to do it. But there are so many vendors there. They're all super helpful. You have all these different bold manufacturers there, and they literally have inventory there for you to actually take it off the rack. They hand you some arrows and a glove, send you across the way to the range, and let you shoot anything that they've done. Um, that'll that'll help you make that decision if you don't have a you know someone that you know that has a lot of bows that you can try out. Um, that'll help you make that decision on where you should start. Yeah, and that's what you gotta try them. And you know, when I had a store that come in, try a bow. You could shoot every bow in the store if you wanted. Now I didn't recommend shooting all of them because if you shoot right-handed, you really don't want to shoot left-handed bows or vice versa. But uh um, you know, we'd set them up. The only thing I recommended though is only two at a time. Right. Because I had one time I got I had like six of them on the floor trying to figure out which one to like. Then finally I got down, it's like, okay. I'm going to hand you a bow. You're going to shoot with your eyes closed and tell me if you, which one you like better and why. I didn't care the why. I just wanted him to express it. So I give him one bow, he'd shoot it, and he gave him a set of all all about the same weight and the same draw length so that you, know, you don't really notice a difference that way. And so he'd shoot one and then shoot the other. Which one do you like better? Well, I like this one. Why? Okay, so I'd set that one aside and now I give him two more. Pick one. And finally, you narrow it down. It's okay, like this one the best because he said, why you like that one best? That's the bow. And, and you know that's what you got to do on, on a lot of these is just shoot them yeah, and, you just you know, find the one that you fall in love with it, it just fits you um when i ended up buying my my canadota custom i went to the rendezvous in comp at compton the run west side of the state and i knew that pat was going to be there and he had a whole rack full of bows and he just said take them and go shoot them and that was like the second or third bow of his that I shot. And I just came back and said, well, I think I'm going to take this one home. 
I mean, you just, you just know, right? You just, that's the one that fits. That's the one that, I mean, that bow is, I mean, from what I shot back then to now, that bow was four or five pounds higher in draw weight than I would have normally ever shot. And it was just comfortable. Yeah. You know, the whole plan was that I was going to have him build me a bow, but I shot that one and I didn't need to, need to have him build me a bow. It was already built. Yeah, it was already on. And, and one of the things that, you know, I, I like them to do is like, put it in your hand. How's it feel? You know, whether it be a recurve or compound, you know, it doesn't really matter. Put it in your hand. How's it feel? Now, if, if you don't like what it feels, then put it up because it's, you're not going to like to shoot it. You know, you get them that, like, it, I like the way this feels in my hand. Okay, let's go shoot it. You know, grab this. I like this one too, the way this one feels. Let's go shoot it. Figure out which one you want. And you know, that's the nice thing about this. We can shoot them all day long. It's not like a gun where you shoot it and ammo's gone. We just go pull arrows and shoot them again. Let's go pull the <laughs> arrows out of the target and go back. Start yeah. Over. Yeah. You can shoot them multiple times and, you know, it, you know, until you break them, you know, or lose them. And, you know, that's, that's about the only way you really get rid of them. Eventually, if you shoot them enough, they're going to fatigue, and then you need to change them out. But especially with aluminum, right? I you have know, some that, aluminum arrows that I've had for since the early '90s, probably that I still shoot. The anodizing is worn completely off. They're just aluminum. There's no paint left on them. Uh, the old game getters. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, we we wore the silver off the front of many game getters. Yeah, you know, that for for those listening who don't know, a game getter aluminum arrow, they're anodized with a green coating over the aluminum. And, and like I've done, and my brother's done, and you you have done, and Tom has done here, as we shoot them enough, and you you wearing them out, put them in a target, pull them out, shove them in, pull them out. Eventually, you're gonna wear off that anodized coating, and that just means you've shot that arrow a whole lot. <laughs> Be paint testers for Easton. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Which one holds up the best? Now, I I normally shot the double X seventy eights, and I don't think I ever wore into the cameling off the double X seventy eights. Game getters we did, but I don't know if you know how they're that's different. It. But <clears throat> that's what I shoot out of my training with bows: the double X seventy eight super size. Yeah, Still they're. Got Three or four dozen of those arrows still fleshed up from I think the last time, other than when I picked that bow up just to see if I could still shoot it. I, they've been in my case for probably my daughter's 26, so probably at least 24, 25 years. Yeah, I don't think I have any. I might have a few of mine left, but you know, I've switched over the years to carbon and you know, I, I've I've wrecked many of them, you know. You, a double X78 Super Slam when you Robin Hood them, they're kind of cool looking. How they kind of, yeah. it, it's not just a split, it's kind of a, a, a kind of almost like a spiraling yeah, like square corrugated. wave. Yeah, a little I square wave, it looks like. like a <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of interesting when you, when you Robin Hood one of those. The, the carbon's a little bit different. Um, and I actually had uh, a little demonstration of uh, um, some Robin Hoods with some different carbon arrows. And it's amazing the cheaper ones, how far they penetrate, as opposed to, you know, the the better quality. They don't penetrate as far. It was interesting how you know some of the cheaper arrows just penetrated so much more. And the one I had was done at seventy pounds at, at twenty yards, so uh, it was, you know, about the heaviest that most of them were going to be shooting anyway. And I have two of them that are fairly recent barely recent in the last four or five years um that are the the gold tip traditionals and they out of a 47 pound recurve they went in probably about an inch and a half just just past the the tip because the tips i shoot are pretty long but uh that's a 510 grain arrow and it stuffs it in there pretty far yeah yeah, I always shoot the bullet points, you know, which are a little harder to do a Robin Hood, especially when I shoot in the aluminums. And and the as you know, the double X seven eights have that unibushing and like and I would bust so many knocks and then I'd have to pull the unibushing out because that got bent. 
And when you actually stick one, you know, because those bullet points are, um, you know, those that are listening that don't know, the bullet point is it's a real flat angle on them, just barely in a point where your combos and field points come to fairly sharp points. So if you get fairly close, you have a little variation. Well, when you have a great big old fat bullet uh, tip on there, yeah, you got to be perfect on them. And I've gotten a few of those and and I've gotten, um, I got two of them when I was working at Cabela's and another one I was working at the Bass Pro. And, and you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, what you're doing. Uh, both of them I got when I was at Cabela's. One was with a bow that come out that was recalled because nobody could set it up. I shot two arrows and Robin Hood had, you know, my second shot stuck inside of another one. And the manager comes out, you're like, here, here's what our guys can do with this bow. What's the problem with it? And uh, the other one was actually a customer's bow. And it was actually right-handed, which was nice. I was putting on a drop-away rest because he couldn't group with it very good. So he right. couldn't group. So he wanted a drop-away. And I'm figuring it's the rest of the problem. And so I put the drop-away on. And those that don't know, but when you have put a drop-away on, you have to shoot them to see if they're going to work. And so I shot an arrow, drawn another one, shot another arrow, stuck two arrows together. And of course, when the guy come in and said, I, I can't group with that bow. You know, I wanted to say, well, hate the bow, dude, it's you. Because I just stuck two arrows together. You know? <laughs> I shot twice and stuck two in the same hole. <laughs> I, when I shot on the man, Men's Unlimited League at Arrowhead years and years ago, um, the the man who actually did it was the chief of the fire department in the town that I live in. And he actually did one back to back. So we had three arrows stuffed together during a men's unlimited league on Wednesday night. This is the first time I've ever, only time I've ever seen that happen. So you're Robin Hood at a Robin Hood. Yep. The guy's name was Jeff Hill. He was the, the fire chief in the town that I grew up or the town <laughs> I live in. Yeah. Now that that is definitely a feat, you know, because you can't normally say, okay, I'm going to stick these two together because there's not many that are good enough that can, can do that. Um, but, you know, there are some out there that, that are that good that they can, you know, hit them knocks and stick them in the other one. But, you know, to do a Robin Hood on a Robin Hood. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> that is definitely a trophy to keep. <laughs> he had he elk hunts a lot in Colorado. And he had, I don't know, two or three different um, elk mounts there at the archery shop. And uh, he ended up, that thing hung up on one of his elk mounts until the day they closed the doors for good on that um, As just a nostalgia piece that he actually did it there in that ring. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that's definitely a conversation piece. It's like, okay, when he tells you how to shoot, well, can you do that? <laughs> How many have stuck a Robin Hood with a Robin Hood? <laughs> it was yeah. super. Yeah, it definitely gives credibility. You know, he's trying to teach somebody how to shoot. And of course, let the, not necessarily because you can shoot good, can you teach? You know, and just because you can't shoot as well doesn't mean you can't teach. You know, there's, you know, as an instructor, I always like it when my students outshoot me. You know, that, that, that's Actually, always good. It's like, yeah. Uh, when they get where they're out shooting you, then that's that's always a good thing. And uh, I know it's it's always interesting when you teach somebody how to shoot. You know, they they get excited and then they're they're shooting and shooting. And um, I've told this story a couple many times, but uh, I had one guy come in, wanted to buy a high end bow, never shot before. Two weeks later, he's got a Robin Hood. Nice. That's because. I would teach everybody how to shoot when you get a bow. It comes with shooting instruction. Because last thing I want to do is get somebody out there, you know, like you with the the one guy he's talking about earlier. You know, you give him a lesson and know how to shoot. Then they're going to stay in the sport because that's what we want. We want people to get into archery and stay in archery. You know, some of us get in it for a while and then out and then back into it. But you want to be in and enjoy it, and that's the whole thing is you know get people to enjoy archery and you know that's the not where you get those people that. You didn't teach them, and then you get bad press. And it's it's always the bow's fault. It's never the operator bow's fault. So, right, um, and it, that makes it bad too. So, it, helping and teaching them how to how to utilize a piece of equipment properly is the the best bet for sure. 
yeah, te teach them how to shoot. You know, if you're open to be, you know, for instruction and willing to put in the work, you know, an archery instructor that has got any kind of experience at all is going to make you a better archer. You know, and, and and that's that's what I say. You know, if you're open and coachable, and willing to put in the work, I could make you a better archer. You know, it might be down to tweaking, you know, little bitty details that, you know, a good archer, you know, it's like, you know, you watch your video, watch it, watch it, watch it. And it's like, oh, try this. You're you're doing this. One little bitty tweak can make a difference. Now, on beginners, when we all started out, everything was off. So it's like, oh, yeah, what's what's what can we fix the easiest that makes the most impact? And, you know, last time drawing. Yeah, we actually bought some some inexpensive GoPro knockoff kind of cameras. And if we're not shooting well for whatever reason, you know, just a bad day or, you know, we've had three or four nights where after work we go out and shoot, we just are stinking up the place. We'll actually set those up on a tripod and, and video ourselves and shoot and then try to pick up, you know, instructing ourselves because you can't actually see yourself shoot. So we right. video it so we can actually see. And it's actually helpful. Um, we've done that. You know, I, I have a really, really long draw length and I got two worn out shoulders. And, you know, it just, I wasn't getting my elbow parallel. And it was throwing off the shot just that much. So you start watching yourself and it's like, well, you idiot, the reason that you're not shooting well is, is that you really aren't at full draw. Your elbow's still four inches higher than it's supposed to. Yeah. Um, it, it does help to actually do. So that's another tip, right, is that if you're, if you're shooting bad, find somebody with a cell phone and have them videotape you for three or four hours. Yeah, I know um, uh, I do a lot of YouTube videos, and I think just about all of them, I've got over 500 videos on YouTube on various subjects. You know, I'm a YouTube channel. I have learned to fix it yourself was the name of the channel. And I think almost every one of them is recorded on my cell phone. Yeah. And now I'll edit them, you know, with the <clears> software <throat> I have on the laptop. Uh, but I, I do them there. But the only thing I do on my laptop, uh, which I've I've got a, a Logitech 920 camera that I use because the laptop camera is blurry on a good day, uh, at least on my laptop anyway. And, um, you know, I record the podcast on there and I do a few, few things on here, but I mean, most of mine is done on my phone because it has, you know, my phone has actually got slow motion capability, super slow motion capability, a wide angle, uh, a panoramic view. Now, I don't use all those just because what I'm doing, I don't really need them. I can zoom in and zoom out while I'm doing them. I can take the camera move them towards me and away from me. And, you know, when I first become an arch instructor in 95, our option was to use a VCR and record you and then play it back. Right. I remember so, doing it, actually. And, and, you know, when I first learned, the guy had a, a VCR camera that he would record stuff we're doing so we could look at it, but it wasn't, you know, instantaneous like we did on the phone. And, and now, you know, with the, you know, the phones and the internet and you can actually teach somebody anywhere, um, you know, just by just by in a video, and and we could even I you could even set up and be shooting, and I could be watching you shooting, and you know, of course, record it, and then we can always play it back later. But I can watch you shoot. And it's like, oh, try this, and we can correct things just, you know, wherever you're at, you know. Yeah, virtually, it's like a virtual, a virtual archery lesson. Right. Uh, actually, my very first um, online student, which is in in the group now, um, was some a guy over in Italy. Didn't have any coaching. Next time, I says, "Hey, let me coach you for free." I'm thinking about putting together an online coaching program, and so he'd record a video. I'd watch it, make giving critique, watch it. You know, just kind of go through then making them better. And you know, I've actually done a video one with a guy and. And he was in Italy. The other guy was in Canada. Um, you know, the podcast, you know, it's all over the world. You're in Detroit and I'm in Ithaca, Nebraska. And yeah, we're, we're communicating just like we're here. And that's just so much, you know, easier now than it was back before. Because 
in order for us to meet, I would have had to go to Detroit. Right. And we'd have had to be in an event together. And, and you know, or you'd have had to come here and be in an event. You know, so the chances of us meeting, you know, back when you know I started was kind of slim. <laughs> right. I mean, the most people in this industry, the only place that everyone's at the same place at the same time is the ASA. Yeah. And now you can you can watch a lot of the shoots at the, these big events, you know, the, the Lancaster ASA or, or any of those big shoots, you know, they're recording it now. So you can actually watch them. Um, sometimes you can watch them live, depending on how they're it set up and or watch the replays. And, uh, you know, just watching somebody shoot, sometimes you can pick up a lot and say, what are they doing? And then how do you learn on yourself? And one of the things that I... I do when when I was doing a lot of 3D shoots and my form, it just sometimes just something feels off and you couldn't figure it out. So what I had is I had a string that had a loop that fit around my thumb that was my draw length. It had a loop on the other end. So I could hook my release to it and I could practice shooting. And if that string didn't jump from my hand straight to the target where I was aiming, my form was off. So then I could fix my form and it's like, okay, now my form is going. Because you, when you're at a 3D shoot, you have a time between when your turn to shoot and everybody else's turn to shoot. So if you're not doing good, you got a little bit of time between, you know, if you're shooting last, you got time of shooting first. Well, something didn't go right. So figure it out for the next one. And, yeah, and I would, imagine you could use something like that. Perfect. You could probably use that for recurve, except you'd have, you'd have to have a little bit bigger loops so you could put your fingers on it. And, and draw back and then just work and it still needs to go off your hand straight because if it's not if you're not going straight to your target you know those that see i just got to push my hand towards my camera if you're going off to the side you're throwing your arrows off that's actually a pretty good idea i'm gonna have to try it <laughs> I'll be make, after this i'll be making up a string so that i'll keep practice without a <laughs> Yeah, and I have, I have a, when I had my store, I had a great big roll of, of string loop material. It's a Campbell string loop material. And, you know, I made a loop. I I have enough of that. I'll never use it all up because you're only using four and a half inches at a time. <laughs> so, you know, I had plenty I could use for that. And I don't know what happened to it. My string disappeared someplace and it's not in my rig. So I'll have to make me up a new one. But, you know, that, that's the way you can practice without actually shooting your bow too. And, you know, I've seen these rubber things out of the pressure, but you're not working on building the muscles. You're working on the technique. You know, is your hand position right? Is your arm got bent right? Is it going towards the target? You know, are you extending to your target? And I see some try and lock the arm out. And what I've seen, when everybody tries to lock the arm out, it pushes the shoulder up. And then what happens is all the pressure goes in the shoulder and all you tend is drop it down. Now you're a little stronger. And... You know, I actually had one of my podcasts, one of the earlier ones, I actually had a, a physical therapy doctor in and we talked about shoulder injuries. And, you know, a lot of old archers have shoulder injuries because they've, you know, been holding the, the bow, you know, shoulder too high. And you probably, yeah, bad form. You know, no matter what you're shooting, bad form is not going to do you good. <laughs> I actually got kind of a funny story. I actually got hurt at my real job. And tore my shoulder up pretty good and after I was able to actually use it um archery was my rehab yeah so they would Star actually they would actually pay for me to go to the range and shoot three times a week for an hour I worked this cop it was the greatest thing ever oh yeah. <laughs> not that you got hurt was a great thing but it turned out okay and it just started with a light pounding bow and work your yeah. way up and it started out, I think, with a 25-pound um, women's compound bow is what I actually started with and worked my way up from there until I could actually shoot my own bow. Yeah, I, I know one guy come in, and um, he hadn't shot before, and he had a bow, and he was shooting, and he come in, and his, his wife commented that his back muscles are getting stronger and, and, and bigger, you know, because you're using those back muscles that you never use. Right. You, you know, when you're drawing a bow, you're using muscles that you never use for anything else. It's true. I know when I shoot a lot, that 
my neck, my upper necklaces are really, really sore for whatever reason. But there, there are weekends when the TG2 crew all get together at my house at, you know, five o'clock on a, on a Saturday evening and we'll barbecue and, and uh, get out there and start playing arrows. And the next thing you know, it's 10 o'clock at night and we got spotlights out there and we're still shooting. <laughs> Yeah. Next day you can't pick your arms up, but it's still fun. Yeah, it's it's still fun. And you know, there, you know, with your shoulders in there, sometimes, you know, you might be drawn back with your shoulders up just a little bit high. Who, you know, who knows? That's something you'll have to figure out. It's like, are you drawing your shoulders too high? Or are you you know draw down? But I've seen people draw across their chest and they're just using their arms, they're not using their butt back muscles when you're doing it. And you, you see all kinds of like the weird forms. Or strange forms or improper form <laughs> however you want to look at it yeah my favorite is the guy who holds his bow almost over his head and then pulls down and pulls it back and then gets a target oh yeah yeah i've seen some of those where they, they go real high and they pull down across their chest and then and like eh, quit you know drawing too much weight or or something because you shouldn't be able to do that I always like to adjust the, the weight and probably, you know, adjusting the weight on, you really don't adjust the weight much on a com, on a recurve, but picking the right weight, you know, I always had them with, with the compounds. If you can slowly draw back, pretend like a deer is out there and, and you have to slowly draw back. If you can't slowly draw back straight to your anchor point, if you have to do all this gyration, that deer is going to see you, it's going to run off. You have no meat in the freezer because you just spooked it off. So if you can't slowly draw back to your anchor point so that you can be stealthy in your draw, you're drawing too much weight. You know, and same thing for, you, you know, the reekers. If you can't draw it back with a smooth motion, if you're, you're going in struggling and struggling, start shaking and you can't get it all the way back, uh, you, you might need to get a little bit lighter bow to start with and work up to it. I mean, and you'll, if, if you start out and, you've never shot before and you start out with a bow that's that fits you and is comfortable and you really enjoy it and you shoot a lot um you'll within a year you'll probably move up several pounds probably at least four or five pounds in draw weight pretty easily if you shoot a couple of two or three times a week and there for a while we were shooting 200 arrows a night seven days a week and shooting a lot of weight can really wear you out on that. I know my first bow, we had it set at 52 pounds, uh, the compound. And, you know, I want to increase the weight. It'd go up to 70. But I was at 52 pounds and, and I'd shoot for a while and I'd you know, bump it a little bit. And, and I got to like 58, 59, 60. And it was, it was just a struggle, you know, to go any further. And then I got up to 62 finally. And then once I got the 62, then I could go just real quick step to 70 after that. But it took me a long time just to add 10 pounds to my draw weight. And, you know, a lot of shooting in improper form. I'm going to tell you right up, it was improper form back then, you know, because that was in the, in the 70s and 80s. And I didn't know nothing about, you know, shooting technique. It wasn't until mid 90s when I even started hearing about, you know, back tension release and, you know, Back then, I was like, well, how do you know what you're going to hit if you don't know when you're going to pull the trigger? And then, then I figured out, oh, okay. You don't want to pull the trigger because you don't know what you're going to hit. That was one of the hardest things to learn how to use with a back tension, please. Yeah. Or no, I, I, don't, I don't actually. Yeah, I don't actually. Yeah. To, to a trigger release and then going to actually a back tension release. That was the hardest thing ever. I punched myself in the mouth a lot of different times. <laughs> I I don't actually use a, a a hinge back tension release, but I shoot my handheld as well as my uh, wrist uh, release with back tension. You know, so you know with the 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 wrist one, I put my finger behind the trigger because the last thing you want to do is pull that trigger. And I don't tell people, put your finger behind it. You know, it's, it's going to be hard to get it behind it because it should be so short. And uh, a buddy of mine, uh, he went from fingers, finally went to a release. And 
he smacked himself in the mouth and he says, the release, it, it failed. It, it failed on me. It went off. And I says, no, you pulled the trigger. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. Because <laughs> it's not going to just go off. You pulled the trigger. You had your finger in front of it. And the process of pulling back, you touch that trigger, it goes off. And what do you do? Your hand's coming back towards your mouth. Exactly. And you smack yourself in the mouth. So I said, okay, put your finger behind the trigger this time when you draw back, and it won't go off. <laughs> right, we used to try all these genius ideas of we would loosen the tension up so that you just barely breathe on it, it would go off. That way you weren't punching at the trigger, you weren't going to throw yourself off, and inevitably you end up punching yourself in the mouth every single time. On, on mine, I have mindset. I've got a Carter um, handheld chocolate addiction to the, the brand, uh, the mild number, and I have the heaviest spring in it that they make. I don't want that trigger to have go off on the slightest pressure. I want to put some pressure on it so I can start drawing back. And my son has a, a another release that's a lighter trigger. I can't shoot his. As soon as I put my finger on that, start a little pressure on it, it goes off on me. It's like, ah. Now, yeah. on my firearms, yeah, I, I like the lighter triggers. <laughs> You'll be able to breathe on it. Yeah. Because yeah. I and I shot on a rifle team in high school, and we had to have a one pound trigger pull, was the minimum we could use. And, and most of them were, you know, set up for three pounds or less trigger pull, but we're not hunting with it, you know, right. so it's it's target and we don't want a hard trigger pull because that throws us off. But on archery, I want the hardest trigger I can. And, and even with the, um, the wrist strap, you know, I want that to be a hard trigger. I don't want movement, but I want a hard trigger. And, right. and neither one of mine are set with any real travel in them as soon as i feel the travel then i start thinking about the release and i quit aiming when you're and that's why you don't want to pull the trigger is if you're thinking about the finger to pull the trigger what you stop doing you stop aiming so what are you going to hit you don't know because you stop aiming right now you don't you don't you have some of that with the recurve you know if you're thinking open your fingers now as you're thinking about open your fingers you're not aiming anymore so you just have to relax them as you're pulling through. And, and you know, so there's a lot of similarities in, in it. The execution is a little different, but it's still the same basic concept. Still flinging a stick down range with another stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's what it comes down to. <laughs> hey, you're just making that stick move. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, there. I used to use a Carter, um, either pinky or thumb rope release, and then I, my hunting bow, I used a Scott Mongers, and we would mess around with it. Finally, I just set it back to what the stock adjustment was because I got tired of punching myself. But uh, yeah. but now you just got to make sure that your finger stays on the string. Yeah, hmm. yeah, and you don't want to bury your finger in too far. You know, with the release, we want them on the second knuckle back, but you don't want your string there. You want your string up on that pad on the front. Now, where do you put yours? Do you put it in between the knuckle and the tip oh, right. or right at the, you can, the first knuckle? Yeah, you can see the wear of my glove. Mine is usually about halfway in the pad, just probably a little bit closer to the first knuckle, but it's between the first knuckle and the center of the pad. It is just the way that it, I got really long fingers, so it's really just the way that it lays out in there. But um, I tried all different kinds of gloves. Um, I finally, uh, American leather is one of the gloves that I use. Um, and they're super durable. Um, I had a PSE King glove that I actually used for over 25 years until they finally wore holes. Um, and I went to a bear paw that, when we were shooting a, a lot, and I mean, we were shooting two to 300 arrows seven nights a week. Um, and Saturday and Sunday, it could have been closer to 500 to 700 because we'd shoot all day. Um, started having problems with ring finger going numb and all that kind of stuff. So we tried, uh, Kenny and myself, we invested and bought a bunch of different gloves and actually tried um, different ones to see which ones would um, help with the whole finger numbing situation. Um, 
got that thicker padded um, bear paw glove was pretty good. Um, and then he actually bought a hill style and it's the finger cots are super, super thick. So you don't get that string feel, but you do, it does kind of help protect you a little bit. So if you shoot tons, probably a heavier glove would be better. Um, I have one that I use in the summertime just because it's hot and it's actually made out of kangaroo and it's really thin, super slippery. Um, but it's just thinner, so your hands are a little sweaty and nasty in that globe when you're out there shooting those 95 degrees on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, but there, there's all different products out there. Um, that that American Leather is just my go-to for whatever reason. It's just a really, really good glove. Um, they actually make them with a Cordura pad on um, for wear. The one I have is called the Cross something. And... Uh, it actually has a double layer of leather in the finger cot pad instead of the Cordura. Yeah, that's it's, the other thing, you know, that the, the ring finger is what goes numb. So even if you had extra padding just on that finger, you know, that, that's why I went to release because my ring finger would go numb and it didn't take many shots because the, the axles are getting shorter and shorter and you can't shoot them with fingers. And you know, too much finger pinch. And now a lot of the new ones are so short that you you could not shoot them with fingers. You couldn't get two fingers on them. And you know, they have to be shot with a release. And that's what's nice about you know the, the recurves and, and longbows is you don't need all this fancy equipment. You know, yeah. you can you know you put on the no gloves, you don't need any glove. Um, you know, it does take a little bit of wear on your fingers, your fingers got to get used to it, but you know, when you're as old as I am, you, you don't have much feeling in your fingers anymore anyway. So <laughs> they don't have sensitivity like they did before. And, you know, like when I'm tying on a um, uh, a loop or something, you know, you have to burn that end of that. And I just use my finger to, to tap it. And like, my feel is like burn. It's like, yeah, I, I don't feel it. <laughs> I've yeah, done it yeah. so much. It's like, I don't feel it. Now, normally I use like the lighter because it it can get a little piece on there. but you know, when you're burning strings for, uh, you know, making your string, I just use my fingers on them because there's, yeah, it's not really hot, but, you know, I've got the lighter in my hand, I'll, I'll tip those and then, you know, kind of tap them my finger afterwards and, um, you know, they kind of get desensitized to that kind of stuff, but they'll still go numb. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's been really great talking with you. I, I know you've got a, a lot lot that you've been helping out people with and archers out there and um we didn't get into any of your hunting stories uh what's some of your exciting hunting stories you've uh you've been on I haven't been real successful so i'm not gonna lie um it's where we hunt there's there's not a lot of deer in that particular area so it's we you know the success is not as good as it probably should be um, it's property that um, we have access to, so that's kind of the situation. But uh, you no, know, it's. I think my own perspective of that is, is it's just the camaraderie, right? We get together, we go north, hang out, go we'll hang out in the woods, chase deer. Um, doesn't matter if you kill one or not. Usually, it's just the the trip up there, getting away from you know the everyday grind. And just going to spend the time in the woods is the most important part to me. Yeah, that there's there's something to be said, you know, going out there and doing that. You know, if you get a deer, you know, that that's just definitely a bonus to get out there and have some meat for the freezer. But, you know, there's been many times, you know, I went out and didn't get anything. And other times you come back with two. <laughs> right. You know, there, um, we've had some unfortunate circumstances at the property that we hunt. Um, property next door got purchased and the guy kind of messed up our deal. So um, we've been spending the last few years trying to get that all fixed up. So hopefully he's now gone and and uh, maybe we'll be more successful this year. That's, you, you never know when the property gets sold, it just kind of all, you know, up to the new owner, you know, how things go. And yeah, the, pe the people that live there now are pretty decent. So I think we'll I think we'll be fine. It's just 
Now we just got to go back in and, and fix what got broken. And, uh, it'll be all right, though. Yeah. Well, that's one thing, you know, we're willing to help out, too. You know, if the, the farmer or landowner needs needs something, hey, you know, let us know. And um, I've had some, it's like, hey, you, you know, I knew they was going to put in a bond or something. It's like, uh, let me know when you're going to put it in on, come help. They never called. I right. you know, never said anything, you know, but we offered. And if they had called, we'd have went. And, you know, that's just one of those things, you know, you'd, you'd bring them a, a gift or something and you, you you bring them some meat if they like the the deer or, or whatever. I know the one place I was hot and I went up and got a moose and, and, and I brought them over some, some moose steaks to, uh, to have, you know, it's, I didn't shoot, I didn't get it on their property, but they let me hunt. So, you know, I right. brought them some and, and, you know, just, you know, the one place I'd, I'd get them a, a, a ham or something, you know, cause you know, he didn't really want the deer. So I'd hand him a steak and, you know, get him a ham and, and get him a, um, you know, whatever he liked to drink and, you know, just, Hey, you know, get him something for Christmas. <laughs> just, just something to, you know, just say, you, you know, I appreciate, you know, being able to hunt here. Right, you got to take care of them landowners so they'll let you come back. Well, and, and you know that the, the farmer they've got corns or soybeans or alfalfa, you know, a lot of the corn. The deer eat so much corn, and you know we're glad to be able to go help them out with eliminating their deer problem. Um, I've I've heard guys tell me it's like that the deer would swim across the river over from Iowa uh, over to his place at night. And they'd swim back during the day because he didn't like hunting across the river and over here. So, uh, you know, I've heard stories where the farmer just like sat there and spotlighted him at night and just shot all of them to come over, pile them up and burn them. Because it was costing him thousands of dollars. And, you know, it told the one guy I was talking to, he says, like, um, shoot it all you want and take whichever, tag whichever one you want. You know, but I would, I'm going to shoot one, I'm going to tag one. You know, I'm not going to shoot them and let them go. Uh, but, you know, that's why, you know, they have deprivation permits. But when they're only coming through at night, they're not there during the day. What do you do? You know, they right. come eat your crops at night and, and go into safe haven the next, you know, in a different state. So it's not like you could go hunt over there, you know, right. especially when the farmer, they didn't allow any hunting. So, you know, it's kind of safe haven. And how do you get them over during the day? And, like, you know, that things you have to run into. And, you know, that's what happens when you, uh, are hunting next to a property that doesn't allow hunting things you have to deal with and hey you just figure out a way to do it and you know i've got one property where they come through mostly at night um, although i did find on the cameras in in april or february uh, they were there in morning and night during the daylight like okay now i'm catching them during the daylight now i know where i might be able to catch them during the daylight because that's that's coming through 10 10 at two o'clock at night when they come through. Yeah, the place that we hunt in central and northern Michigan, um, we put out cameras in. All the activity is mostly at night or early, early, early in the morning before daylight. Um, the deer that we do see there, we usually see them right at dark. You know, even when you get them into, you know, 13 to 17 to 20 yards it's dark so even shooting a recurve it's it's still legal shooting light but just barely legal shooting light. <laughs> um you know it's in with that last couple of minute window usually um still cool to watch them though. and uh we've sat there and had to scare them out of there so that we could actually get out of the blind and go up dinner so. <laughs> yeah I, i've i've had that a couple times too where they're they're come in and, and it's it's dark, you know, because I don't like to get down right away just in case they're coming in. You know, I'm right. done hunting. I got my bow hanging up because it's it's past shooting time, so I'm not going to shoot. And they'd come in and, and like I can hear them walking around. I can't see them, so I I know they're there because I can hear them walking around. And it's like and you're you're caught standing there, and, and you got to move once. So then you move and make a little bit of noise, and then they run off, and then you wait a little bit, and then they get down and, and leave. But you know you hate to spook them too much because then now you're educating them. <laughs> right, exactly. I've and also had the other. Was, yeah, I've also had the opposite situation too. Oh, what was that? Yeah, sometimes they just pop up out of nowhere. I remember we were 
it's probably two years ago. Um, it was dark and we were getting ready to get out of the ground blind and you know, grab your backpack and your bow and you're getting ready to sit up out of your chair and there's a deer fighter in front of you. And it wasn't <laughs> there when you looked down. <laughs> yeah, they do that. They'll, they'll come in and they're so quiet, all of a sudden they appear and then other times they make all kinds of racket. Right. Yeah, you, you you think it's an army coming through, and no, it, it's just one deer making all kinds of racket. Yeah, it's you, you never know. You got all kinds of stories that we can tell, you know, hunting, and you know that we get so close to them sometimes, and some of the critters don't even know what you are, and they're just land on you. Bird. I've I've talked to guys that had birds land on them. Haven't had any land on me. I had them land, you know, within range. I could kick them with my foot. But uh, I've had other guys, it's like land right on their shoulder. <laughs> I was hunting in Milan, Michigan, which is kind of south of Ann Arbor-ish area um, years ago. And I had a big old sow raccoon come down the tree directly behind me when I'm sitting in a tree stand. That was a little unnerving. She yeah. came right down right behind me. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, at least they didn't walk across you. Yeah, that might have hurt digging the claws into you. <laughs> Thank goodness she didn't. I'd have probably just fell out of the tree at that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, in in parting, what would you say to somebody that's looking to get into archery? So, my my advice is find somebody that has the passion that can show you the right way. Um make sure that you don't out bow yourself for your first bow um just because you shoot a 35 pound bow doesn't mean that you always have to shoot a 35 pound bow but i've found by shooting lighter poundage bows it makes you a better archer because you learn how to do it the right way. Um, good, good advice you don't, you don't learn you don't learn bad habits um over bowing yourself makes you learn bad habits Usually also gives you a big old raspberry on your forearm. Um, but uh, that, that would be my key advice is, is to find somebody that has the passion that can teach you the right way. And uh, make sure that you get a bow that fits your body and not your ego. Um, start, out, start out small and slow, and eventually you'll be able to work yourself up to you know, a higher poundage bow. And there are people killing deer right now with 35, 40 pound bows. So it's not like it's you know, a 35 or a 40 pound bow is not going to get the job done anyway. But there are state regulations some places. So make sure if you do decide that you're going to hunt somewhere, that you at least meet the minimum requirement if you're going to try to, just to protect yourself. Yeah, you want to make sure you're within the, the legal limits. Because if you're below that, then yeah, that, that's that's not a good thing to happen. Because the, the the rangers they don't care. It's like that's the laws, and uh, you get a copy of them or have access to a copy before you get your permit, and you're expected to know them. And you know, just hey, and if you're not sure, you know what? Call the game wards and say, hey, this is this is what I got. Is this legal for me to shoot? And they'll tell you, yeah, it is, or no, or and if no, then what do you need to change? And, right. and they'll let you know. You know, all of them I've talked to have been real friendly. You know, as long as you're not doing something illegal, <laughs> they're friendly. And, and ask them, just just ask them. It's like, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. You know, is can I do this? And you know, they'll tell you yes or no. And if it's no, then you can ask them. It's like, okay, what do I need to change so I can do this? Another thing to remember is is that archery isn't just deer hunting, right? It's you can bow fish like you do. You can small game hunt. You can stump shoot you can target shoot. you don't ever have to hunt anything it's archery is a sport that you can it's very versatile you can do lots of different things um it's it's uh it's really fun well and what you fling that arrow at is up to you as long as it's legal to fling it at it then go right ahead exactly Well, it's been great talking to you. I've enjoyed it. And I'm sure our listeners got a lot out of it as well. I, I every, every time I talk to somebody, 
I always learn something and it's a, it's a lot of fun doing this. And, uh, you know, for those that uh, want some little more information, uh, you can, you know, get a hold of us or you can go out there and join the Arch Talk 101 Facebook group. Uh, there, you know, we have both technicians as well as instructors that can help you anywhere from shooting the recurves, the compounds. Uh, if you're not sure how you're shooting, take a video, upload it to the group, and we'll give you some pointers. Uh, no cost for that. Just take your time and enjoy. So I'll leave links to uh, get a hold of TT2 Archery uh, in the description, as well as how to uh, join the archery group and anything else. And we have uh, a lot of information for you, and we enjoy bringing it to you. My name is Roy Canterbury, and I've been your host today on Arch Talk 101 with our special guest, Tom, on the line with us. Thanks for being here.